The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for um, your time today in joining our Sage 300 webinar on the best new features and tips in Sage 300 Cloud to boost your productivity. I'm your host today. My name is Kui Boon. You can call me KB. And today we all have our speaker, Charles, who will be sharing with you all the new features and tips that you may have missed in the numbers of release that we have re recently. So before we begin, before I pass over to Charles, a couple of housekeeping rules today. So number one, all of you will be placed on mute until the end of the session where we have our Q&A, uh, where you can ask your Charles any other questions that you might have. But until then, all of you will be placed on mute. Then for um, for the any questions that you might have between now and till the end of the session, what you can do is that you can place them in the uh, question panel that you see on your GoToWebinar control panel. So any questions that you have, just place them there and we'll go through that at the end of the session where we will have time for Q&A. So without further ado, I will pass over the ball to Charles for him to take you through the new features that are available within Sage 300 Cloud. Charles, over to you. Thank you, KB. Uh, maybe you can make me the presenter so I can share my screen. Yeah, you should be the presenter now. All right, let me just show you my screen. Can you see my screen, KB? Yes, yes we can. Okay, good afternoon and thank you for your time this afternoon. My name is Charles Sheng. I'm the Director for Product Delivery Asia and I'm located in the Singapore office. Uh, I'm gonna take you through uh, and show you a few uh, important areas that I think that we have added to the product, which I think as customers of Sage 300, you should be aware of and you should be considering to take advantage of. Now I'm gonna, first of all, go through uh, in three particular areas so that uh, because of the limited time we have, I'm not gonna go through all the small nuts and bolts, but certainly three broad areas. The first area that I will touch upon is the work from home solution. Now I'm sure some of you have already implemented some sort of work from home solution in your business. Some of you may be located in Singapore, so I believe you may have already heard about the e-invoicing initiative from the Singapore government. For those people who are in the neighboring countries, you may have heard of it that your country is also considering things uh, of this technology. But there could be some of you who may see the, the need for e-invoicing to be sooner rather than later. So I'm going to cover a little bit on what you can do in the meantime. All right, so, but before I begin, uh, maybe I just want to catch up a little bit on uh, what Sage is up to. I don't think you guys have been uh, reached uh, by anyone so far in the Sage organization, giving you an update on how Sage is performing in the global market space, right? So in case you are unaware, Sage is a fairly large size company. We have about 12,000 employees spread around the world. In Asia alone, we are present in Singapore and the KL office. Uh, in Australia, we also have offices in Sydney and a number of uh, cities in Australia marketplace. Now, in terms of financials, you can see that we are financially pretty healthy. We have a uh, recurring revenue of uh, previous year first half uh, at 826 million pounds, right? And substantially, a lot of our revenue comes from uh, the, the fact that we are actually on some kind of a subscription type business, right? And we have about roughly two, 2 million customers around the world. For those people who are in Malaysia, you may have already heard that we are the winner again of the Frost and Sullivan Accounting Award 
and this is the second year we are achieving this. In Singapore, we are also pretty good in the sense that our payroll product, Easy Pay, uh, last year won the bronze award, and I think uh, this is a good testament that Sage is doing well uh, for their customers as far as the product is concerned. All right, so I'm not going to go into cash field for a moment, so I'm just going to quickly go out and go into my web browser. I have here, if you can see already on my screen, I'm actually on a cloud hosting service provider's website. Uh, conveniently, I'm using Huawei intentionally. You know, As you know, some of you guys have read the news, Huawei and uh, the US government is at loggerhead. But uh, as far as uh, Asia is concerned, they are pretty aggressive as far as offering their cloud-based services to the customers. So I'm using their cloud-based solution, uh, the, the services, to actually show you some of the possibilities they can do if you want to move your on-premise installation to the cloud so that you can make it easier for your employees to access the application. Now, you can see that in most cloud service provider, they will actually provide you with a kind of friendly user interface for you to actually create your own uh, cloud service. Right? In this particular case, I'm going to show you how easy it is uh, in, the, in this particular vendor's uh, offering. However, I will not take you through the whole process, although it will take roughly about half an hour to complete. I don't think the intention here is to sell you Huawei Cloud this afternoon, but just to show you what you can actually achieve with uh, a cloud service provider hosting the Sage 300 product line. Right, so quickly, I'm going to click on the Buy ECS button on the top right-hand corner. It will actually bring you to a wizard-like screen that shows you how you can actually very easily choose the options that you want and the system will automatically create a virtualized environment for you to actually install and run your application. Now you can see it right at the top here, there are three very distinct uh, offering that they have, the yearly monthly offering, the pay per use, as well as spot prices. Typically, I would, I would recommend that someone who is using this for the first time to actually go on a pay per use. The reason for this is very simple, right? Once you go on a yearly monthly subscription, Bear in mind that that contract would then be for a month or for a year, right? So if you think that the configuration is not right, it is very troublesome for you to uh, change, right? Because you have to use up that contract period before you can actually change the contract arrangement. So I suggest you use pay per use. No difference here. Pay per use is basically saying that I want to be able to shut down the, the service when I'm not using it and I want to turn it on when I'm using it. So I conserve the cost that will be incurred using this cloud service, right? So you can choose the region that you want to have your cloud to be uh, to be set up from. Very important here, some of you guys may be worried about the, the, the data sovereign issue. So some of you may say, I want to have the data in country and not in some remote location in China. So it's very important for you to be able to choose a location for where your data will be located, right? And then you choose one of the possible configuration of hardware, right? So you can see here, you can choose by computing type, whether you want memory, large memory, this intensive, whatever it is. But generally, I think the general computing class is more than sufficient. Choose something that is suitable for your requirement. And then you can see at the bottom here, because it's pay per use, you can see how much it's gonna cost you. If you were to choose this option and say, yes, I wanna buy it now, it will cost you 0 0.0994, of a US dollar per hour. So it's fairly reasonably in price, as long as you can control your usage and not let it run uh, 24 by seven. So it should be a reasonable price. And once you have done that, all you have to do is just click next and the system will then prompt you for other questions. And before you know it, you have a working system. But before we do that, I just want to show you that uh, what we have done with uh, Huawei Cloud is that we have actually pre-installed our product onto the cloud, right? The reason for this is very simple, right? Because if it is pre-installed on the cloud and you are completely new to our system, you can actually provision for something very quickly by just choosing one of the images there, right? For those people who are already using Sage 300 and you would think that you would like to move from your on-premise to the cloud service, again here in Huawei, you just choose the equivalent configuration on the Huawei site and automatically a new system will be set up with the exact version that you're using. So all you have to do now is just transfer your data over to the cloud service and you should be up and running literally within hours. 
Now, I will not go through the whole process, as I said. So you can see roughly here, it is pretty easy, right, in a sense, right? So what I want to do here is show you how it feels like when you have something like this already configured. So I'm going to make use of the remote desktop connection to connect to this particular IP address, which is a uh, service that I've already created in Huawei Cloud. All right, so you can see from the top here, uh, it is showing 114.119.183.45. That happens to be the IP address of the server that I've previously provisioned in Huawei Cloud. So I have already got the Sage 300 application installed with my data all pre-set up here, right? So this is how easy it is for your users to actually uh, go on board the Huawei Cloud. Uh, all they have to do is give them the IP address and the username and password for them to access the system, right? So once they go in there, they type in uh, their password to go into Sage 300 and there they are. You can see here there is it's no different uh, whether you're using Sage 300 on-premise or on Huawei Cloud. It looks exactly the same. There is no change as far as the application is concerned. But of course, one of the exciting things about Sage 300 is that we also have the ability to run our application through a web browser, right? So you have two choices here. You can actually run the desktop version of our product also on a browser, but that requires you to subscribe to something extra, nothing too expensive, something reasonably priced, but that will be uh, something to consider should you want to uh, allow your users to actually use a browser instead of using this remote connection method that I just showed you earlier. Now, once you have the system configured, you are you're running, when you print any reports, it's actually going to print to a local printer that's sitting in your location, right? So it's important. So if your users are now working from home, they may have a home printer that they want to print to uh, instead of printing to the office and they have to go back to the office and collect the printout, right? So such technologies are smart enough to actually redirect all the printing that you have to a local printer in your own home comfort. Right. So, okay, now I'm not going to go into the application because I think uh, you guys are all familiar already with the product. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that I can also access this application through a web browser to access the web interface, right? So you can see here my my URL here has the same IP address that I use for logging on to the Huawei Cloud Server, right? So I'm going to type in admin uh, password. Give it a few seconds so for it to uh, fire up all the things. So now you notice that here, I'm looking at the web browser interface. Hopefully you guys are not hearing the uh, 911 siren in my background. If you do, at least you know this is a live uh, telecast and not a recording, right? Anyway, for those people who are already using the Sage 300 web interface, you probably will notice that well, my screen looks a little bit different, right? You can see here the menus, the color schemes a little bit different, the layout a little bit different, right? No worries, uh, this is uh, the latest version of the product. The intention here is uh, to actually show you a little bit of what is coming very soon to, to your business if should you choose to upgrade to this latest release, right? Essentially, I'm gonna go into order entry, maybe just to show you how order entry looks like. Uh, not that it has changed in any dramatic way. You can see here, I'm in the order entry screen. Uh, it looks exactly like your uh, order entry screen that you are familiar with in the desktop, or if you are already in the web interface, it is probably looks the same, right? The only slight difference is that you notice here, I'm able to control a little bit more on what is being shown here, right? So for example, if I want to be able to go and change the font size of my screen, which is currently using large, so small, what actually happens here, you can see now I can see more of my screen in this in my in my display here, so that I don't have to have to do a lot of scrolling up and down, right? So for those people who are using those wide screen monitors, 24 inch and so on, in order for you to do more with uh with with the equipment that you have, bear in mind that the new release that's coming down the line will be able to allow you to actually change the font size 
so that you can actually do more without having to scroll. Right? This will make it a bit more comfortable for you to use if you have a lot of data entry to do, especially in functions like this, right? The order ent entry functions. Now, whatever it is, it is uh, pretty useful for someone who is going to be working from home instead of having to be only be offered the desktop interface, which is probably be a bit boring after a while. You want to take a look at the new look and feel. By all means, you can actually opt to implement the web interface. But what I want to actually show you here in the screen here is the uh, the additional functions that you will find only in the web interface that you don't see in your normal desktop interface. And that is the inquiry function. Now, I find the inquiry function is very good because you notice here I can very easily choose one of the available inquiry. I'm going to choose the sales history, right? the OE sales history. I'm going to click on it. And you can see that it immediately brings up a screen that shows me all the information about uh, my orders that I have in my history table. right? Now, obviously, this is important because a lot of you guys I know usually will require to, to use one of the standard reports to print it on the screen, save it as a file so that you actually can go on to the Microsoft Excel environment to be able to do some kind of analysis or for reformatting in order to meet your custom reporting requirements, right? Without having to go to the business partner to get them to create a custom one for you. So this function is very useful because you can see from here, I have open up my order sales history. I can see all the information here. If I want to, I can customize this look and feel. Once I have it done to the way I want it, all I have to do is just click on export. And you can see here, it will be sending it out to an Excel file for me, right? So it's very easy and convenient. With a few mouse click, I can convert what I'm looking at into an Excel rows and columns. And from here, I can very quickly choose insert Viva table, or maybe I go to recommended Viva table. And immediately I have a report that maybe already makes sense to me, right? So I can maybe just drag a little bit of information here, uh, location name. So very quickly with a few mouse click, I can pull it into an Excel spreadsheet, into a pivot re report, and I can now slice and dice the information I want. Now, this is one of the benefits that you, you, you gain when you are actually making use of the web interface. All right, so now what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to switch over back to the uh, the old screen that people are familiar with, right? In this particular case here, I'm going to lock in here, and this is probably familiar to all of you who are already using the web interface. You can see the interface is a little bit different from, uh, from the one that I just showed you a moment ago, right? So this is the existing web interface that you are familiar with. All right, so you can see here, uh, the color scheme is a little different, right? Uh, the menu system is exactly similar to whatever you're, you're familiar with. It also has the inquiry function that I just showed you a while ago. All right, sorry, not this one. Uh, the other button, the bottom one, right? Where you can choose and uh, and do whatever you want, right? So on this on this particular case, but let me just move a little bit faster. Let me just touch a little bit on the cash flow management feature that we have seen uh, that I talked about in a, a short while ago. You can see here I have a new menu added to the bottom here called Cash View, and you can see here it has its own menu system, right? But before we jump into the dashboard and so on, let me just give you a little bit of background on what cash flow all about. Now we know that cash flow management is a very complex issue, right? Because uh, usually it requires people to actually dive deep into your data and to actually create a lot of interesting reports before you can actually make and take advantage and have benefits on cash flow management. What we have done with the Sage Trainer product is we have developed a module called Cash View. And what the Cash View product does is that it actually is embedded into your product, it analyzes your data, and it actually look at your cash flow position ahead of time. And when he detects you have a problem, he actually notifies you through an email. Now this is important because we also know that many times business owners, the CEO or maybe the CFO also, uh, usually they are not regularly using Sage 300, or sometimes they don't even use Sage 300, right? So they depend on someone that goes into Sage 300 
actually providing them the information for them to be able to tell whether the company has a cash flow problem. So for this group of people, uh, because they normally don't access stage 300, it's important that they be able to access information of this nature without having to log in, right? So we use email in this particular case. Now, you notice here I have a, a Gmail account set up here, and I notice that I have an email already uh, on my desktop that have not been read yet. It basically says, say sends from Stage Cash View an alert for Office Private Limited. So I purposely have configured this particular company to have a cash flow problem. Right, and I want an email to be notified to sent to me so that I get notified on the problem. Right, so if I click on this email and open it up, you can see that there are two sections to it. The top part here has a very simple email content that tells me there are four steps that you need to take because you really have a cash flow problem with this company called Office Private Limited. Why is it important that we label the subject line this way? Is because you may have a lot of email that comes to you on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So you want to make sure that something catches the eye when it when it reaches you, right? So intentionally, we have this sent from Sage Cash View as the first part of the email subject line. So if you see this, you know that there is something that needs your immediate attention. The second part of the subject matter says alert for Office Private Limited. Now, Sage 300 is a multi-company system. So it is possible for you to be running a number of businesses. So you want to know exactly which particular business of yours is currently facing a cash flow problem. Bear in mind, this email alert is not telling you that you have a problem today. It could be telling you that you have a problem three months down the road, five months down the road or something like that, right? That is the whole beauty of Sage Cash View. It is giving you a forecasted notification. It is not telling you you have a problem today, so you are too late, right? You, by the time you react, is all over, right? So you want to know in a period of time, and this is a perfect system that does that for you automatically, right? Now, it has four simple steps. So all you have to do is, if you don't have account to go into Search 300, maybe it's the time for you to contact your accountant and say, hey, can we make a time quickly? We need to address this cash flow problem that uh, I noticed is being sent to, to me via my email. You also notice at the bottom here, there is a standard chartered bank uh, banner, right? So we're not spamming you with uh, unnecessary ads here, right? This is in collaboration with Standard Chartered because we know that if you face a cash flow problem, right, rather than asking you to go and find your own solution, we decided that it's good for us to work with a bank that has a special arrangement for our customers such that when they take up the offer, they know for sure that the deal is a good deal, right? So the way it is done here is that it is only applicable to customers who are using Sage 300 today and has this cash cash view enabled in Singapore and Malaysia for the time being, right? We are not ready now to offer to all the customers in other location other than these two countries for the time being, okay? So if you are in Singapore, Malaysia, when you receive this, basically what happens here is that we have not only analyzed that you have a cash flow problem, but we also determined that you could be potentially be already a, a proof to take up a loan with, uh, with Sinus Charter Bank because we have analyzed the financials of yours and found that you are actually a well-run business just that you may face a little of a cash flow crunch sometime in the future and therefore you might want to take note of this particular offering. Right, so once you have this information uh, available to you then maybe it makes sense for you now to go into the cash flow module and go into the dashboard all right you can see when the moment you go into the cash flow system it also warns you that you have a cash flow problem right so essentially it repeats exactly what you already know right from your email that you receive you know your cash flow problem when you go into the system you also will be notified so it's important right we also want to make sure that accountant who actually uses the Sage 300 product on a day-to-day -day basis, when they go into cash cash view, they, they may not be the recipient of an email, but they can also see that, oh, you have we have a cash flow problem, right? Maybe I should go and remind my boss, right? That uh, we need to sit down and take a look, a closer look. And you also see the offer for the standard chartered loan, right? Now, of course, if you are not in Singapore, Malaysia, you will never see this banner appearing. You will also never see the banner appearing if you do not meet certain condition of a loan offer, right? But bear in mind all this, right? We are analyzing your data, but we do not send any of your financial data to anyone outside your company, right? So even Sage doesn't know that you have a financial cash flow problem, 
We don't know, right? It's only the application and you who is only aware of this whole arrangement. Now, if you choose that, you can contact Standard Charter Bank to say that I don't, I saw this message appearing on my screen. I would like to take up this loan offer that you have. That is when say Standard Charter Bank will be aware that you are using Sage 300 and that you are actually being notified through the Sage Cash Field product itself. Now, let's take a look at the dashboard itself, right? And you can see the dashboard is comprises of a number of widgets. And these are financial uh, matrices that we think even for a person who is not financially trained, should be aware of and should be able to understand very easily, right? I have on the top left-hand corner, two very important ratios, the quick ratio and the current ratio. Uh, these are basically measurements of how successful you are in your business, right? Typically, if you're not a financial person, just bear in mind that if you see a positive number and you see a green arrow head pointing upwards, it means you are financially healthy. Right? If you see a negative numbers or you see a red numbers and then you see the arrow is red color pointing downwards, then you know financially you are in trouble. Right? Now, in this particular case here, although you have a cash flow problem, you notice that your financials are healthy. Right? So maybe something else is giving you the problem. Right? The when, but also bear in mind that when you see financials pointing up, upwards in green, it may also be not exactly a healthy sign because it also means that you have a lot of cash rich, but unfortunately you are not utilizing your cash in the best possible way. Maybe in, in this particular time of COVID-19 lockdown, it may be good to see green arrows, even though it's not a good sign that you're using your cash in the best possible way, but conserving cash may be the right move for the time being. But if you normally see green, I think it is a time for you also to analyze how are you spending your cash and how are you investing your cash in your business? The more critical in the matrices that we have on the screen are actually the four in the center and to the right of the, of the dashboard, right? Do you have on the middle pane, day sales outstanding and days payables outstanding. Now, these two are very important, a very important matrix that you should be aware of. It's very simple to understand. DSO or day sales outstanding, it basically is a measurement in days of how long a customer takes to pay you on average. So 159.42 is not exactly a good sign, right? It basically tells you you have customers that take you literally almost 160 days before they actually pay you. So there are people that takes you longer to pay you. There's some people who pay you more uh, in time, but on average it's 160 days. So it is important then to compare to what normally you offer to your customers. So if typically your standard average uh, terms that you offer to customers, 30 days or 60 days or 45 days, then seeing 160 means that whatever you're doing is no longer the case because your customers is ignoring you and not and not uh, actually paying you on time. The same thing with days payables or standing or DPO, right? It's also a measurement of how, how efficient are you to pay your vendors, right? So obviously here, you're also a bad paymaster. If you see 132 days, uh, if your average days you take to pay a supplier, right? Well, it could be a reason, there could be Good reasons for that. There should be some uh, contention in some deals that uh, you did not pay them for a long, long time. So it skews your result a little bit. As long as you're aware of the situation, then you should be saying, okay, no problem. 132 is uh, is fair enough. Looking on the right-hand side, you also have two other matrices. One is called AR collection. And the bottom one is say cash conversion cycle. These are great stuff as well, because AR collection basically tells you the number of uh, the, the, the the collection capabilities of your AR uh, clerks, right? Are they very efficient collecting money? So this is a measurement of the total outstanding versus the amount you're collected to date, right? So the smaller the value, the better it is. So it is not too bad. Your percentage is 17.72%, uh, so it's, it's fairly reasonably okay. Uh, however, look at the cash conversion cycle, you can see that you again here, here have a challenge because cash conversion cycle is a measurement of how fast you can convert inventory into cash, right? It's something called inventory turnover, right? So if you see 170.7 days, you know if your business is a fast moving product type business, then 170 days might be too long, right? So you may want to take immediate action. Maybe it's time for you to run a promotion campaign or, or something to that nature, right? So these are useful KPIs that will give you an idea uh, of your business as a, as a whole at a very high level. You also see there's some uh, additional information that we have on the screen here. 
Uh, for example, the net cash for operation shows you by in exact detail how much is going to be coming in, how much is going out, what's the net cash position at this moment in time. You also see a chart at the bottom uh, which shows you uh, the cash flow position in chunks of days. Notice here it is not by periods, uh, as in uh, period one, two, three, four, five, six, and so, so on, but it's showing you by range of days. Now, this range of days can be modified by you, right? So if you think that your business doesn't look at one to 30 days, you look at one to 60 days, 61 to 120 days, and so on, on a, on a longer term basis, you can reconfigure the system to use those yardsticks. But essentially what you see here is, at a glance, you can see the, the uh, yellowish green bar is basically showing you the uh, cash in and the darker green bar is showing you the cash out. And what you see on the line chart is a net cash position, right? So that net cash position is the net result of in and out plus whatever you have in your bank account at the moment. You can see here, fairly healthy. You have actually some uh, uh, high value uh, cash position, but why is it that the system is not telling you that you have a cash flow position of a, of a problem, right? So maybe you want to go in a bit deeper. So you, we also have the cash flow summary screen that actually shows you, again, by the uh, the days ranges that I talked about earlier across the page. Down the screen, you can see here we have cash opening balance, which is what you have in your all your bank accounts at the moment. We have the net from operation, the money going in, money coming going out, the net cash position. We also have the other activities. Now, I won't talk about the other activities in a short while, but imagine this. In the current column, you see that you have about 2.4 million currently in your bank account. After looking at your inflow and outflow uh, position, you can see that the net position that you have at the end of the current period will be still 2.312 million. So we are pretty okay, right? Now, you can see that 2.312 million is now the opening balance for the second column, one to 30 days. Again, it shows you what is going to be expected to come in and going out in the next one to 30 days and the next net position. So, so you can see here at a glance, you can see how your cash position is like over the days ranges ahead of time. So where exactly is it that you're facing this problem, right? I can tell you that you're facing it in 91 to 120 days. The reason is very simple, right? Because you're going to be expecting to spend this $500,000 on some activity and the net position then brings you down to 1.815 million. Somewhere in the system, you have configured the system to always maintain and not modify, notify you if the cash position goes below 1.9 million. I'm going to show you in a short while where you actually specify that. But imagine that in your mind, right? You always tell yourself, I need 1.9 million cash position at any point in time in my business. So I, need, I set that as a threshold. Anytime it goes below that, I want to be notified. Now, where does this half a million comes from? I can say these are the other activities. I can see at the bottom here, I've entered one, says I implement a new warehousing system, 500,000, somewhere in December the 10th, 2020, right? So this money has not been spent yet, right? So this is money, something that I plan to spend in December this year when I have the new warehousing system in place. Now, because this system is sitting on top of your accounting data, so this half a million dollars is not captured anywhere, right? Because you, you still have not spent it yet. So by the time December comes, right, you key in this, you already will have a problem in hand, right? So you want to be able to put in things that you intend to spend ahead of time, and then the system will then plot out for you whether you're going to have some cash flow problem further down the line, right? So it could be buying a new warehousing system. It could be setting up a new... Uh, a new branch office in Jurong or in some lo other location, or it could be you're going to sell off some some part of your business and there'll be some cash coming in. So these are all, all not recorded in your accounting system at the moment, but you want to be able to capture them in this particular function so that it can be reported accurately for your cash flow management, right? Now, whatever you enter here does not impact your accounting data, right? So what you see here is information pool from your accounting data, plus whatever you're capturing here, right? It has no implication as, as far as your balance sheet, income statement, your tax reporting to the government, et cetera. These are information that you are capturing here for the purpose of management and reporting. Now, obviously, we know that uh, we have a situation 91 to 120 days where actually you will be spending some money 
putting on a new system in place, right? So generally, you also want to see whether there's any problem with your collections from your customers, because obviously you saw earlier, your AR people are not actually collecting fast enough. So you also want to see who are the customers that are actually very slow paymasters. So by going to the AR summary screen, we have given you the top 10 customers with outstanding balance, sorted from top down, right? So you can see here, this Mr. Customer, Mr. Ronald Blank, actually has an outstanding balance of $172,280, Singapore dollars, right? And you have actually given him a $200,000 credit limit, so no worries, he's still within his credit limit. And you also notice that you have a column called highest balance, right? So for example, this particular customer, uh, has 233,000 highest balance and this other one at 580,000. What actually this column is telling you is that this customer has somewhere in the past has actually reached this level of balance, right? Uh, but they are still customer of yours. So with this information, maybe you can tell very clearly that no worry, this customer are actually good paymaster, right? So in the past, you've actually extended to them uh, even though the credit limit is one thousand, you actually extended to them, allow them to owe you all the way up to five hundred eighty thousand dollars as well, right? And there's no concern there. Of course, you also want to know who else are owing you money because they're only showing ten here. So we can actually print out the this report here. Okay, also print out the receivable forecast report, right? The reverse receivable forecast report is basically showing you over a period of time in the future how much are you expected to collect, right? So due in across the page in 30 days, 60, 90, and so on. And you can see that this is now going down to the invoice detail itself. So this is important because with this information now, you could actually zoom in into a specific column and see who actually owes you money, right? And whether you can actually collect in time, right? So if you scroll down here, you can see that, all right, so not much of a problem here. Most of these customers here have, uh, have most of the AR outstanding as current, so there's not much of a problem, but you can go to the next page and so on to see where that you have actually a problem somewhere, right? All right, so similarly, you, you also have the same capability with accounts payable, right? So you also want to make sure that you build up good relationship with the suppliers. So you want to make sure that you do not go uh, and actually unnecessarily make them unhappy with you and they decide to stop doing business with you. Right? So you can see here, you can do the same thing here. You can also print out the payables forecast report as well. Right? Now, because you recall earlier, we saw a standard charter banner page, right? You notice because of that, there's an extra tab that appears there called loan. Now, if that screen doesn't, that display doesn't appear, you, you will never see this option for call loan, right? But if you do see it, when you click on it, actually you come into a loan submission screen. Now this is again, right, reminds everyone, if only if you're in Singapore and Malaysia, that you actually get to see this feature because this is in collaboration with Standard Chartered Bank. And you only get to see the screen if you actually see that, that banner pop up, right? That, that uh, advertisement banner popping up. Then you get to see the screen. And you notice that when you come to the screen, most of the information that is needed to be filled up is already completed for you, right? For example, you can see the loan cap amount is 300,000 and by default, it, it fill up 300,000 for you. Of course, if you do not think that you need 300,000, you only need 100,000, you can change this at this moment here. There's also the contact information that is also pre-populated for you, right? So during the setup of this cash module, we actually will ask you to fill up some of this information so that when the time comes, you don't actually have to do any more uh, uh, information gathering, right, to fill up. And you can see here that it has uh, automatically selected lena.office at gmail.com as the sender of this email, right, because it's important that only legitimate uh, persons in the company can actually send this email to Standard Charter Bank for them to be able to uh, process that request of yours. And you can see here it goes to a Standard Charter Bank account, right, a proper at sc.com account. So I'm not going to click on submit because you've got to get a standard charter relationship manager all excited thinking that I'm going to be taking out a $300,000 loan with them, right? But in, in real life, if you actually click submit, an email actually goes to them. And according to what I understand, within 48 hours, they should be able to contact you, uh, at least with the contact information you provided here, to actually go through the whole process of onboarding you for the loan. Right. You can also leave a little bit of command and information. You can also specify who you want to copy uh, the, the email. Now, bear in mind, right? 
when you click on submit and send this email to Standard Charter Bank, it is exactly what you see on the screen that is being sent to them. No financial information about your business is being distributed and shared with Standard Charter. Neither is this information shared with, with Sage. Right? This is very clear. I think when you are setting up a system, there's a lot of screens uh, in the setup screen that tells you that we are basically governed by the by the General Data Protection Act. So we have to follow by those rules, which means that we do not send information that is confidential without any consent. Right. So this is very clear. Bear in mind, we are not actually doing any of these things. Right. So once you click on submit, an email goes to them and they will contact you. And if you are happy with the arrangement, they will actually take up the loan with you. Now quickly, before I jump on to the next topic, I just want to show you where some of this information that I talk about is being captured, right? In this option setup screen, you can see here, I have a $1.9 million value set up as my threshold. This is exactly where you will come in to tell the system, in my business, I want to set in as $1.9 million. So again, depending on any on, in your actual business, how you see yourself as, uh, how you see yourself, you want to manage cash flow, right? You specify here. And also you are able to capture the duration days that I talk about, right? Uh, you also can specify which of your general ledger accounts that will be used to measure your opening balances for cash. And you also specify what email account will be used when you are sending that email to Standard Charter Bank. You can see here, there's a lot of advisory and also consent that you have to give, right? So for example, advisory, Right, email is used to communicate a list of cash flow threshold breach. It's also used to communicate marketing material, blah, blah, blah. So if you understand this and you agree to it, great. We will do, perform this action for you, right? So if you think this is not acceptable to you, then you can turn off using this use email notification. You can set it to no, right? Then we will turn off this notification to you. The only time that you actually get to see some of this information is you come into this function and you will see the notification being presented to you. All right, so that basically wraps up my talk on uh, uh, cash flow management. So I'm going to go to my third topic, which is Go Digital. Uh, this is a new initiative by the Singapore government, right? So to do that, I'm going to go over to my accounting system, right? You can see here I have a e-invoicing module already configured uh, in this particular company of mine, and there's a number of uh, folders uh, in it. First of all, I'm going to go into the registration because this is very important, right? You can't send electronic invoices if you are not registered with the e-invoicing network in Singapore. It's just like you can't make a phone call unless you go and subscribe to a telco for a mobile number, right? It's simple as that, right? If you have no mobile number, you can call anyone, right? You can buy all the phones you want. They are not able to talk to anyone, right? Other than using it as an expensive tablet, maybe to serve the internet if you have Wi-Fi. But if you want to send a e-invoice, first of all, you must be connected to a what we call an access point provider. And you can see in this screen here, I have connected to a, a company called Sesame. Now Sage actually have been working with Sesame in Singapore. It's a Singapore company, by the way, uh, that is into this uh, procurement portal business. Right? For those people who are not familiar with Sesame, you might want to check them out in the internet. Right? Who knows, maybe you may find their service useful because they do aggregate all the procurement re requirements in the country and put them into a central portal system for people to be able to view and actually bid for, for work or for, 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 uh, what you call that? for sales, right? So this is very important that we work with a company that is familiar with this kind of business to build some kind of connection for us to be able to send e-invoices. Now you notice here, there's also a PEPO ID, right? So once you have registered with Sesame, they will go and register with the government and they will give you a PEPO ID that you can actually save it into your system here and use it every time that you want to send off an e-invoice. Now you notice all these fields are all disabled and you can't actually enter them. That is because we want to make sure that this information is being uh, recorded and saved into your system without you actually having to type it in, right? So it's important that uh, you do that in the first step, right? For those people who are worried that I'm not ready to do invoicing this month, or maybe not, I'm not even ready to do e-invoicing this year, maybe next year I might consider it. So should I come back and look at this feature next year? An answer is should not. 
because by registering with the government organization, they actually will give you a $200 grant straight into your pay now account, right? And you can make use of this 200 grant to pay for the e-invoicing services. Not that it costs you a lot, right? For example, the arrangement with Sesame, we actually offer you the ability to send e-invoices way until next year for free. And then after, we are going to charge you a, a, a small token fee. I think, I think maybe that is the processing fee that Sesame will have to charge you for that, right? So I think it is, if I'm not mistaken, I'm quite certain that Sesame is the cheapest in the whole Singapore market, right? If you can find anyone cheaper, I'll be quite surprised because everyone is offering, you know, 60 cents, 70 cents an invoice. Some even went to the extent of $1 invoice, right? I think that is crazy. What Sesame is offering is free for now, and literally when the time is, they, they're ready to charge you something next year, it's probably gonna be in cents, right? Literally cents, okay? No, not even close to 10 cents, I think, right? So I think it's worthwhile for you to register now so that you are ready. Now, once you have registered, a couple of careful things that you wanna watch out for is if you are registering because you need to sell something to a government or government-linked company, if you are a Singapore business, bear in mind that you are traditionally sending your invoices through the AGD network. The AGD, for those people not familiar with it, is the Accountant General Department's uh, network, right? So you actually go into their portal to actually submit your electronic invoice, but they are not going to allow you to do that method anymore. They expect you to send it via this e-invoicing uh network that they have set up now right so when you send it to them you actually have to actually indicate certain special information so they can recognize you that you are actually already registered with them right as a vendor so you got to put in your vendor id you also got to enter your email address here right these are important because this information is actually already defined and captured in their network so you're basically capturing them here so that the system can automatically send this out for you when the time is ready for you to send an e-invoice. All right, we also allow you to actually uh, scan through your whole list of customers that you have and choose only those customers that you think you need to do e-invoicing with, right? So it's not that the moment you set this up, every customer is now no longer allowed to be invoiced the old traditional way. No, you can still do that. It is only from this screen here, when you put in a PEPO ID, that the system knows that this customer will still will want to do business with you through the e-invoicing method, right? And if it is a AGD uh, when customer of yours, then you must turn on this AGD switch here, right? So you notice that when I turn on this uh, for this customer, I turn on, yes, you notice that the, the PEPO ID is automatically populated. Right, this is again a time saver. Do not worry what is a PEPO ID for the government uh, operations, right? The moment you say yes, you know what exactly what to do, right? So that you won't accidentally key in the wrong uh, value and then the invoice goes nowhere, right? But it's also important for you to have this information fill up here, right? For example, you want to make sure you fill up the person that is supposed to be attended to, right? Because when you send invoices, the company, the organization may be receiving invoices for a lot of suppliers, right? So you want to make sure that your invoice go to the right person in the right department. So you want to make sure that the attention to name is properly filled up here because when that invoice reaches them, they know exactly who to notify, right? There's also the business unit. There's a lot of government organization around and all these business units are all listed with a different code, right? So you must make sure that you know the code that you need to use for that particular company that you're going to do business with, right? So you will key them into this screen here, right? If you think that you want to drill down to the AR record, we also have the ability for you to double click on the row and that will bring up the customer so that you can make some changes here, save it so that it will be reflected here as well, right? So once you have actually completed, the next important thing is that we also give you the flexibility, right? You know, in some cases, when you're doing business with somebody, right, somebody will require to send over information uh, a little bit different uh, than normal, right? So we want to be able to cater to that uh, arrangement. So what we have done here is that looking at the first column here, you can see it's pretty technical, right? Don't worry, this part here is actually the, the format of the e-invoice as governed by the 
uh, organization that manages this e-invoicing. You need the help of a partner to actually tell you uh, if you want to take a particular value in, a, in your screen, pass over to that particular element in that e-invoice, they will actually know how to actually choose for you the right field name or even the right table name, right? So once you have all the configured and safe, automatically this will be used whenever you do this. One other thing that you need to set up before you can actually use this is the unit on measure mapping. Well, unfortunately, right, when you are sending invoices to someone else, right, you may call it each, someone may call it something else, right? Someone may call it piece. So when you need to do this electronic passing of documents without anyone having to worry about, can you understand my invoice uh, data? You can actually perform this mapping here. Now, very important, this mapping here is done properly because uh, in the e-invoicing network, there are just so many unit of measure that is being recognized, right? So if you are already uh, using a particular unit of measure in your business to describe your product way of measurement, you need to go and look up this list and ask yourself whether there is an equivalent value and whether the value is exactly the same value they're using. If they're not, then you need to go and specify here. For example, here, you notice I have this particular value. The second row is EA full stop. And I map it to EA because in the union measure, in the e invoicing world, you put EA dot, it is invalid. There's no such union measure. So it must be EA. So even a dot, you have no choice but to actually use this mapping to make sure that the system will send over correctly for you. So once you have done that, the next thing is for you to be able to send invoices to someone else, right? I want to show you what, what happens first by when you key in an invoice, right? We want to make sure that no one is uh, confused and no one is disrupted when they are actually keying in invoices. So what we, do, what we have done is we decided that we don't want to modify the entry screen such that the user need to be trained differently if they're going to send out e-invoice, right? So they will do exactly the same as in normal cases. So let's say, for example, I type in 1400, right? Because I'm using sample data, the data is actually uh, using Canadian as a currency code. I fill in exactly what I normally would do when I'm selling things to my customer, right? So let's say I put in, you want to buy two of these. And let me just key in a few more items. Right, so this twelve dollars and one more last one. Let's say I don't key in a free charge, right? And this time, uh, for some of you may not be familiar with the it is ability for you to uh, to pop up a calculator. So just in case, for example, the standard price, right, is a formula or some sort, right? So you want to pop up the calculator, right? Uh, for those people who are not familiar with this option. Right, because it's sometimes it's so well kept uh, that you do not know. Just press the shift plus button and this screen will pop up, right? And whatever value is in the field, it will be shown here and you can actually now do some calculation on it, right? So we'll calculate 1.2 equal, right? And I'm gonna paste it back. So you can see here, very convenient, right? So you have a lot of complication and you don't no calculator handy. This might be a useful tip for you. Shift plus, okay, this is nothing new for those people who say, wow, this is new, right? Where do you learn this? Well, this is available since day one, right? Since uh, the year 2000, right? So if you are that long a user, you might have come across this feature and so on, right? So now click, click ship all and create an invoice from it, right? Let's click post and you can see the invoice number is uh, 75, right? Okay, so we're not gonna do any of this printing out. We're gonna save it, 75. Now I'm go over to the transaction screen. I'm going to send this e-invoice to my customer, right? So how do I do that? You can see here I have a OE invoice processing console function. Why is it done this way? Because we know that in your business, you may have more than one person actually entering orders, right? You may have different departments entering orders, but you may want to control who actually have the authority to send out these invoices because e-invoice is not like a normal invoice, right? Where you print out, you can sign on the on the PDF document, scan it back in the system and then attach it to an email and send it to your customer. E-invoice means 
system actually literally hands off, right? From the moment you enter the invoice to the moment you send and get received, only the computer system network will actually show and have this data flowing through. But there is no human being touching the data at all, right? So that is important. So because of that, we decided to build a function like this, right? So you can see here when I click on retrieve invoices, 75 comes out, right? So I can choose which invoice I want to send out. Because some invoices, maybe I do not want to send out. Someone keys it in. Maybe it's not the right time to send out yet. Maybe I just want to keep it here and maybe send out a few days later, up to you, right? But if you think that this is invoice is something that you want to send out, you can click yes, right? And you have two choices. You can click send. Immediately, it will be routed to the uh, Sesame network and be sent off to whoever is the customer that you have uh, configured to be sent. Or I can do this other thing. I can save to file and click yes. Right. What is interesting about this is that I want to be able to save it to my computer system because maybe during the implementation stage, I want to make sure that all these invoices that I created in my system are genuine and valid. Right. So how do I test that they are of that nature? Right. So what I do here is I save it on desktop. Let me quickly go to uh, the desktop here. I probably have a 74, 75 here, right? So I have invoice number 75 here, saved to my desktop. Let me go back to this place here. Now, IMDA or uh, the Singapore government actually created a website called Validex, Oops. right? where I can actually drag and drop such a document, right? And be able to see whether the document is processing correctly. Oh, okay. Let me, let me log in again, right? Okay, so it's validating and here you go. Let me try to bring this to the main screen. Okay, so now I say that it is a tick. It means that invoice that you have created is a valid e-invoice, right? Based on this Singapore Pepper BIS UBL V3.0 format, right? So again, here, there are a few standards here. You can choose a standard you want to verify against, and it says view report. It shows you that there is no problem, right? Everything is green to go, right? But you also want to see whether the, the data that you sent over to them, when translated back to a proper invoice document, does it contain the right information? So you can see here, when I go and click display, I can see using the, the display mode provided by IMDA or the Singapore government, I can actually see the three, the invoice that I just created, right? I see the two items of the freight charges and so on, right? And you can see the amount as well, right? So if I want to go back to my search 300, Go to my transaction screen, go to invoice, right? And I'm going to the invoice number 75. I can go to total. I can compare my numbers here with the numbers I see here, right? I see it's $134.80, right? And all the tax information and so on is correct, right? This is important because during the implementation phase, you want to make sure that all the things that you have set up to prepare yourself for e-invoicing is actually complete and correct before you actually send them out, right? So this is a good tool provided by the government for you to do this validation, right? Now, if you are interested in to, to do this, I suggest two things first. First of all, if you're not registered with the with the Pepple network, I suggest you quickly do so to take advantage of the $200 grant. Not a lot of money, but then it's, given to you free, you might as well you grab it and use it to pay for the early invoices that you're going to be generating, right? And I think $200 is going to last you a long, long time. If your invoice volume to the AGD is only a handful a month, right? So this will last you for, for quite some, some time. But if you intend to use it, even with your other customers who are not necessarily government, and they are also e-invoice ready because if you are able to send invoice to the government using e-invoice format and your other customers are also able to do that, why not you send invoices to each other also in e-invoice, right? That will save a lot of work for everyone, right? Because with a few months click, you're able to, to, to do that. All right, so now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint and I'm going to do some wrap up here. 
right? So in summary, the right software can make things simpler, right? So you can see here, Fish 300, with our ability to be hosted on the cloud, will be very useful in these times where you actually need to implement your system such that your users can actually access the software conveniently from the home, or even for that matter, if you want to be able to access it uh, while you're on the road, right? You want to be able to use a tablet to be able to call out an invoice or be able to call out some customer information and so on. And uh, you can actually do that if you are already in a cloud service, right? However, if you already have this ability, uh, it's also wise for you to re-look re at how you're doing things and have a look at the cloud hosting services and compare whether there are some cost savings and whether there are performance improvements Remember, right, if someone is hosting your cloud service, they are at least required to actually ensure that their cloud hosting services is right, have a very high uptime, right? Now, if you try to do it on your own by making your own server accessible to the internet, right, your, your ability to service your customers will be as good as how robust your network is, right? So again here, there may be challenges that you face doing on your own, so it might be wiser for you to actually try using someone else that work. And as you can see, the cost is pretty reasonable if you if you choose the right option and contain how you use it, right? And you also see that we have the ability to help you to do one of the most challenging things in any business, right? How to actually be able to manage your cash flow, be a little bit one step ahead of, of the of the curve, right? Be able to be aware that you have a cash flow problem ahead of time rather than always reacting to issues in your business. So for the first time, you're actually gonna be, you know, be actively managing your business rather than reacting to issues that pops up every other day, right? And last but not least, you can see here with the government initiative Go Digital, uh, again here, it is a time saver. Uh, if you are expected to do e-invoicing, when you do business with the government, there, there's no other choice, right? I believe now, slowly, and, and I think quite surely, I think they will no longer allow you to uh, submit your e-invoice through the AG network without going through the PayPal network, which is this e-invoicing network, right? So it is important that you actually go and get yourself registered. And although my program is not ready for you to use today, we are almost there. We are just doing some beta testing now. Uh, we would like to see some early adopters, uh, customers who, who definitely need to use this e-invoicing feature to come to us. We'll help you to set up a test system for you to get used to the whole process. Make sure that your data is all uh, ready for it, right? And when you decide to go live with it, it's just a matter of uh, turning on the same option in your production database and you are up and running, right? So all you have to do is just let us know your intention we will be ready to help you to get up to speed on that basis. Now, the last slide here also shows you what other uh, solution set that Sage actually can offer that actually work with your Sage 300. Now, a lot of times we, we, we're looking at our own uh, system and we think that uh, there are certain things that we want to do that, that will help us to do our business more efficiently or more effectively. Uh, there's none, right? We have to go build our own and so on, right? And sometimes you just want to know, is there something like this available in the marketplace that I can just buy and deploy rather than have to you know, spend time building my own? Take a look at uh, what I have on this, on this screen here. You can see here, uh, beside accounting inventory, we have manufacturing, CRM, service management, point of sales, access, BI, workflow, and a whole lot more, right? So all you have to do is just talk to, to us, it's Sage, or talk to your business partner. We should be able to help you to identify uh, additional third-party solution that can help you to improve your business. All right, with that, I hope that uh, it, it has been a useful one hour sharing. Uh, I just got over time by about a few more minutes, right? I hope that uh, whatever I've shared with you is useful. Uh, I'm gonna pass you back to the host for you to ask questions if you have any, but if you're too shy to ask it online, uh, take note of this email address, info.asia.sh.com. Always email us and we are more than ready to help you. Thank you very much. Back to you, KB. Thanks, Charles. So right now I'm gonna unmute all of um, the participants. So if you have any questions, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself and then um, ask those questions.
Uh, meanwhile, um, I'm going to read through some of the questions that we already have. So, Charles, if you could able, if you are able to help us answer some of them, that would be great. Um, in in the essence of time, we will probably keep this session short. But if there are any other questions that come in later, we will get back to the individuals later. So, first question. Um, I think the individual has seen the what Charles you've demonstrated with um, the virtual cloud services online earlier about how you can access Sage 300 onto the cloud. So if a customer is interested in that, how should they proceed with this? Charles? Sorry, Charles, you might be on mute. You have muted me actually, so I was trying to talk. <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right, so uh, very simple, right? Uh, talk to your business partner, right? But if your business partner have no clue on, on this, because not all the partners have actually uh, signed up with one of these cloud service providers, right? For those who have signed up, they probably will be able to, be able to immediately explain to you the process on how to get on board, right? But if you think that your business partner uh, do not have the information ready for you, you can always reach us at info.asiash.com. We will then speak to your partner and see whether we can uh, make that arrangement for you. Thanks, Charles. Another okay. question. Yeah, for some of these new features that you've just introduced, how can um, our customers get hold of them? Okay, so if you're talking about the uh, cash field product, it is already available, but it's only available to those people probably on uh, their search cover, I think, right, if I'm mistaken. But the cash, cash view is currently available all the way from 2016 version to 2019, right? We are working on getting it to be usable also on the 2020 release, right? So if you're on 2020 release, uh, speak to us. I think if you're using desktop, it will also work. It's just that uh, we have not fully completed the porting over to the web user interface for cash view, right? But if you're 2016 or 2019, perfect, right? You are, you are ready to go and all you have to do is just get the installer from us and you are ready to take advantage of it. If you're talking about the Go Digital e-invoicing, uh, at the moment, you, if you are on 2019 and 2020, you can install the registration feature and register with the PayPal network. But if you think that you really need to send e-invoices now, contact us at info.asia at sage.com. We want to sign you up as an early adopter, no charge to it. All we just to do is we'll help you to set up a test version of your system, right? In your premise, right? Nothing to do with taking your data out or anything. We'll set up for you and then we will install and activate this module for you show you what are the things you need to prepare your data and actually helps you and guides you through the process of sending e-invoices. And when you're comfortable with that and the product is ready for production, we will then convert your production system to be able to use that particular module, right? But if you talk about some of the features that I showed you in the demo earlier, where you saw me showing you the web interface that looks a bit different from the ones that you're using, right? That that new version is coming up very short, shortly, right? Uh, not too long from now, so just be a bit more patient. Uh, the feature where you can actually do inquiry, saving it into an Excel file so that you can do pivot charts and tables and so on, that one is already available if you are already using the web interface, right? That feature is only available to people who are using the web interface and not the desktop interface. Right, hope that answers the question. Thanks, Charles. Um, one other question that I have here is um, for the slides that we've presented. Yes. So after this session, the recording and the slides, we will be sending that to you in an email. So all of the part participants, you can review that um, subsequently at your own time as well. Um, just one last question that I have here before we wrap up the session today. So Charles, um, the question is, uh, can, what are the some of the new features or the new enhancements that you can look forward to in the upcoming releases? Can you give like a, a brief overview? Okay, uh, that will probably take 
a fair bit of time, right? So but I will just mention a few that I, I recall top of my head, right? Obviously, there are the ability for you to do, uh, depending on how old your version is, right? There are quite a fair bit of changes. But I think one key critical thing that I think many people have missed out is that when you are moving from one version to another, right? Very often I see uh, because security is turned on, many times certain things are locked down for you in the past, right? So when you get upgraded to a new version, essentially the same lockdown is in place, right? So you're not gonna be able to see the new feature when a new version is installed because in the past, those features are not available. So when you are moving to the new, the security uh, setting will not have those features turned on for you, right? So you will never knew that there aren't actually new things, right? So my thought is this, whenever you want to know what is new, uh, if you do not want to spend time reading the what's new document, right? And, and follow them for every release, I think you should catch up with your business partner and ask them to run a specific webinar for you that explain what is new because they will know exactly what version you're on. So they'll be able to show you what are the new features in each of the release since until the most latest. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing is, I also notice a lot of people, um, they may not actually explore deep enough on some of the functionality in our product, right? Personally, I feel that Sage 300 actually is not only feature rich, but some of the features that we, we provide to our customers are actually rich, not just in its ability to do that, that thing, but able to do it well uh, for that particular thing, right? So I will say that my 300 product is actually not just simply the breadth of features, but it also exhibit depth of features, right? And I think some of these things are so well hidden in the system that I think a lot of customers that may have missed it out simply because they do not either have the ability to access those new function because of the security rights, or they have not been briefed properly by the partners on what is new, right? So if, if you particularly have a need to know exactly what is new for your system, talk to your business partner. If they are not uh, ready to explain that to you, Again, like I said, right, reach out to us in info.asia. We are more than glad to uh, have a look at your system, what version they're on, and actually shows you what is new from that version on until the latest. Okay, so I hope that gives you an idea of how you should reach out to get the information you want, rather than me giving you a full long list here. But for those people who are really curious, uh, recently we have actually introduced, beside the cash field, the e-invoicing thing, we also have done some changes to the ability to handle multiple con multiple contacts. We also add a feature to handle AP and AR withholding tax. Uh, we also added a feature for people to capture uh, tax in a general ledger journal transaction, right? Some, something that has been not available for since GST or SST has been uh, made available into the marketplace. Right. So again here, maybe you may have a general ledger journal, not an AR, not an AP transaction, but a GL transaction that also required to capture taxes. The, the current release actually has this GL tax module capability, right? Hopefully that gives you a very quick roundup, although I would think that it's not the full comprehensive list. Yep, thanks Charles. Back to you, KB. So the last one here, and something that Charles, you really just mentioned earlier, is if you want, if any of the customers here wants to be an early adopter for the e-invoicing, do drop us an email at info.asia.sh.com so that we can get in touch with you and you know be the first couple of users to make to use our Sage e-invoicing module to send Pepo invoices to your customers or to the AGD. So with that, I don't see any other questions in our chat today. Um, I'm, we, and we are about a couple of minutes over time. So I'd like to thank everyone for your time um, to, to join us in this webinar today. We will, as mentioned, share the recordings and the webinar slides with you post this session. And do keep in touch with us. Um, stay, uh, stay updated on all the future webinars that we'll be running on this platform. And the most important thing, keep uh, stay healthy 
keep yourself safe and we'll see you again in the next session. Thanks, Charles, and thanks everyone for your time today. Have a good day and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.